Welcome everyone to a Clear Mountain interview. As you can see, I have the great good fortune to be here with the venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi Bhante. Thank you so much for, for allowing me to come and stay at Chuan Yin Monastery where you live now. And I thought it would be just a horrible uh, mistake if I wasn't to take up the opportunity to interview you and, and hear some thoughts. So I thought um, that maybe the theme we could take was Theravada teams themes in translation. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah. So basically going through some of yeah. your works, this yeah. isn't even... Well, maybe we can try covering all of it um, yeah. in an hour or so. Yeah, yeah, let's see what we can do. <laughs> and basically with each work, we'll work somewhat sequentially, and which is also how you translated them. Oh, I see, you've arranged the books arranged them sequentially. In, in the order that you translated them. Okay. And then just pull out themes which are fascinating for translating Theravada Buddhism, a yeah. Southeast Asian religion, yeah. into a Western language and Western concepts. Yes. So the first book to go into is actually just the appendix to this life of Jnana Tiloka Thera. Yeah. This the appendix which you wrote is a life sketch of Venerable Jnana Ponika, yeah. who is your teacher. And I'm curious, one of the themes that I find fascinating about this is the relationship between a student and their teacher yeah. and the value of gratitude and yeah. Yeah. both katanyu and katavedi, so yeah. gratitude, thankfulness, yeah. and giving back. So yeah. could you speak to that at all, that this theme of gratitude in your relationship with Venerable Nyanamoli? Well, it was Nyanaponika, yeah. Nyanaponika, excuse me. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's easy to confuse one Nyana with another. Okay, I first met Venerable Nyanaponika during actually my early time in Sri Lanka. Venerable Nyanaponika was not my ordination teacher. I was ordained in Balangoda with an eminent Sri Lankan scholar monk named Venerable Balangoda Ananda Maitreya. Yeah. And he was pretty much my early Pali teacher and Dharma teacher. Yeah. But I met Venerable Jnana Panika during maybe what, my first or second month as a, as a Samanera, I made a trip to the island hermitage. He was not living at the island hermitage at that time, and I didn't know that he would be there, but I just I knew that the island hermitage had a historical significance for Western monks, so I wanted to see the place, and so I visited it, and it was just by chance, it was in November, and Nyanaponika Tara was there because he had the practice of after the Vasa, I think it was at Katina time, he would make a visit to his alma mater to the island hermitage. And so when I arrived, he was there, and then we had some chats, and we felt a certain, I would say, a rapport. And then as I continued with my studies in Balangoda, when I had questions, I would write to him. Was he having being a European? You know, he would understand the Western way of thinking about Buddhism, and so we developed a certain closeness. And then I was in India in 1975, and looking for a place. I was think, planning to return to Sri Lanka, and I wrote to him about that, and he said, "You can come and stay here at the Forest Hermitage." And so I came, and then I stayed with him. And it was through that connection that this very close relationship developed. And then I went back to the United States in 1977. But then I came back to, the, to Sri Lanka in 1982. And then in 1984, I came to stay permanently at the Forest Hermitage with Venerable Yanapunika. And I looked after him for the last ten and a half years of his life, right up to the day of his passing. The life sketch in that book goes up detailing a lot of that, including that last morning when you were yeah. basically in the, the same the same building with him and he yeah. passes away and yeah. yeah, very it's so touching that you spent the last ten years of his life with him. It's kind of unfortunately un, un very rare in a mm. Western society to yeah. see that and um yeah, I think that speaks to, I mean, mm. yeah, this relationship between a student and a teacher. Anything else you would like to draw out about that that relationship? It's somewhat rare in the West. Um, 
you know, one uh, feature when I was staying with him during the last, say, from about 1990 on, maybe the last four years of his life, his vision had been gradually deteriorating. But during the last four years of his life, his vision was virtually gone. I mean, he could see shapes in black and white. He lost the color vision and lost, you know, precise focus in his vision. And so he couldn't read. And so generally every evening we would find books that would be of interest to him. And I would spend like about an hour reading to him out loud. And I would record the reading so at a later time he could listen to it on his own. Yeah, usually we had a subscription to Time magazine. So usually it would take like two evenings a week to go through the articles and time that were in, of interest to him. And then the other five days of the week, I would read from books to him. That's so humanizing. Yeah, I yeah. think a lot of people, when they think of monks, especially Westerners, get a very austere, impersonal image yeah. in their head. But this yeah. is just so intimate. You mean you're reading to your teacher yeah. as, his, as he's going blind? Yeah. So, yeah. And then during the, the very last like week or so of his life, actually like two days before his passing, we pretty much took leave of each other. Like, you know, he knew that he was going to pass any day. And I knew that too. And so I said, for any faults I might have committed, please pardon me. And then he said, he could speak only with difficulty. So he said, oh no, I'm so grateful to you for looking after me. And then that it was fortunate we took leave on that day because the next two days he would speak, but his voice was no longer intelligible. It's not that he was speaking unintelligible things, it's just that he couldn't, I guess the vocal cords or whatever what's involved in the articulation of speech just didn't produce intelligible sounds. And then we there was a German couple who was coming and they would provide soup for him and sometimes stay with him for some time. So we thought maybe he could speak in German and they would understand. So we told him, please speak in German. The Nietzsche's are here. And he spoke something, but again, they couldn't understand the German. It's beautiful that your relationship with him continued even past when, I mean, part of what drew you to each other was the intellect. You were able to talk to each other about your you know, growing understandings of Buddhism, and it was yeah. largely like a matter of cognitively getting one's mind around Buddhism, and yeah. and then even when that passed, yeah. um, you're still able to mm. relate to him. And I think he'll play somewhat of a background or foreground role in the next several books mm -hmm. that we'll go to. So, yeah, yeah. So the the next book is the All Embracing Net of Views <laughs> okay. with uh, so the dot uh, Nikaya number one with its commentary. Yeah. And I believe you did this when you were yeah, maybe three or four years in robes, yeah. which is fascinating. And also, you did this sort of at the behest of Venerable Nyanaponika, or? Yeah. He, okay. I mean, he didn't give me an order, you yeah. should translate that. But he said, I would really like it if somebody would translate the commentary and maybe parts of the sub-commentary to the Brahmajala Sutta. So you have a compilation with the Sutta commentary and parts of the sub-commentary. And he had, probably in the late 1940s, I think when, he, or maybe in the earlier 1940s, maybe when he was in the internment camp in India, or maybe it was in the late 40s when he was at, back at Island Hermitage, he had translated portions of the commentary and the tika, the sub-commentary, in a notebook. And he had given that to me at an earlier time when I was visiting him. And then that way I had picked up the style of the commentaries and the sub-commentary. Of course, the sub-commentary style is very difficult. But in a way that his notebooks with selections from commentary and sub-commentary was my way of learning that style of Pali. This brings up two themes, which I think are really fascinating. One of them is just the contents of the Brahmajala Sutta itself yeah. is all about what is the Dhamma and what is not the Dhamma. Yeah. And then another theme is you know, the whole idea of commentaries. 
So with regards to the first theme of what's Dhamma and what is not, it's popular yeah. in America to have this kind of Buddhist romanticism where all paths lead to the top of the mountain. Yeah. Um, and that's a yeah, large view of many who are just yeah. getting to know the Dhamma. Yeah. And so translating this would be somewhat, it could be seen as a challenge. So maybe touching on that theme first, how did you come to relate to this concept, which we find in the very first sutta of the mm. first collection of the sutta mm. pitaka, that there are things which are dhamma, there are paths yeah. which are dhamma, and some yeah. which are not. So, yeah, and I think that perhaps is the reason why the compilers of the Pali canon put the Brahmajala sutta at the beginning of the Diga Nikaya, the first collection of discourses, though so in the other collection or version that we have corresponding to the Diga Nikaya. This is the Dirgagama, preserved in Chinese translation. The Brahmajala Sutta does not have that first place. In fact, uh, offhand, I'm not sure whether it's in the Dirgagama or whether it's in the counterpart of the Majjhima Nikaya. But it doesn't have that first position. But I think the compilers of the Pali Sutta Bitaka put it at the beginning because it's a kind of guard dog mm. <laughs> at the entrance to the Dhamma. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> heretical views wearing monastic robes and with a shaved head try to slip through the, gates. <laughs> the guard dog will start barking. <laughs> It'll sniff them out. <laughs> View of self or no self. Right. View of creator God or no God. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> they detect creator God or view of self. <laughs> then they start growling and baring their teeth. <laughs> wow. So that, I, I did, I think I was weaned into like deeper and deeper and more kind of confrontational suttas slowly by yeah. reading just my own self-selection from access to insight at the mm. time. But yeah, I mean, coming from a Unitarian background, which is very much mm. ecumenical, yeah. you know, take from any path, all paths yeah. are, are the same. Did you find it at all difficult? That's one question. And then how soon do you think people should start paying attention to in realizing that not every path makes it mm. to the goal. Yeah, to the first question, I didn't have any difficulty okay. with the Diga Nikaya because I was trying to understand, you know, clearly, like, what is the principle of the real Dhamma? Mm. And, you know, I wasn't involved with the views affirming either either theistic views or views that affirm a self or popular now is sort of non-dualistic views affirming like one all-embracing reality so those were not didn't correspond with my own inclinations and i wanted to see you know what how the buddha makes a sharp divide between what is genuine dhamma and what are the false views mm -hmm. or the wrong views that he rejects and these are views that in the brahmajala seems to be views that were current in some form or another in the indian intellectual philosophical uh, matrix of his time i mean another feature of this and the next three books which you translated yeah. is that you don't just can feature and translate the sutta, you translate its commentary yeah. by Buddha Gosa as yeah. well. And this is something else which is somewhat controversial in that you've got schools of Buddhism, you know, traditional Theravada yeah. in Southeast Asia that basically take anything that um, Buddha Gosa says, these commentaries mm -hmm. say, is the Dhamma. You know, this yeah. is, you need to take every jot and tittle, every yeah. tiny bit. And then you've got schools which are almost like Protestant Buddhism, which just you know, go only back to the suttas yeah, yeah. and reject everything yeah, that Buddha Gosa yeah. says. How did you come to have this, or what's your relationship with the the commentaries, and how do you suggest that other people relate to the commentaries, Westerners especially? Yeah, well, my own 
sort of attitude has been, I would call it maybe a middle way with regard to the commentaries. Like, I see like many like valuable, important elaborations of the material in the suttas, and many quite new ideas that are introduced in the commentaries, which are still in accord with the Dhamma, but provide maybe a more panoramic perspectives, and then finer, more detailed, more granular perspectives on some of the doctrines that we see in the Sutta Pitaka. But I don't take the attitude of grasp, a kind of fundamentalist attitude towards the commentary, saying that the commentaries are infallible and absolutely correct, but one sometimes has to look, you know, critically at the commentaries and be able to discern what is acceptable, what is unacceptable. I'm trying to think offhand what is unacceptable. Hmm. I mean, occasionally, like I would find like some explanations of points. Um, passages that I think see what the commentary is often doing is taking the kind of systematic um, presentation of the Dhamma that one finds in the Abhidhamma and then reading those ideas into the suttas and so what I would say is that perhaps that kind of explanation of the commentary can be accepted, but not in an exclusive way or in a totalistic way, like it's providing an elaboration from a particular perspective, an elaboration in line and determined by the particular system through which the commentary is reading the suttas. But it would seem to me, unfortunately, we don't have, or at least I don't think we have something like the Savastivada commentaries mm. or the Mahasangika commentaries on, say, the Sutta Bhitaka. If we mm. did, we might see elaborations of the same Sutta, but from the standpoint of the sy systematic exegetical framework of the Savastivada school or the Mahasangika school mm. or the Dharmaguptaka school. Yeah. That seems like such a, a reasonable and pragmatic approach yeah. to the commentaries that I yeah. I'm surprised at the rather dogmatic extremes yeah. with which Westerners either yeah. reject or you know, well, seem... Usually it's the elder generation of Asian monks, maybe particularly mm. the Burmese, who are very set on the, in, on the infallible mm -hmm. reliability of the commentaries. So the next um, work which you translated similar is another sutta in its commentary. This is the Mahanidana. Yeah. Sutta in its commentary, so this is Diga. Actually, I think you skipped over the Mula Pariyaya, which yeah. came next in the, in the sequence. Right, right. We didn't, weren't able to find that this morning, which is, Bonte has written so much that this is only, you know, a small portion of what he's translated. Um, but was there anything you would like to draw out about the Mula Pariyaya? So you, you had... Yeah, well, I also did the Mula Pariyaya, because is pointed out to me, or some people in Sri Lanka, more scholarly people, saying that this is called the Mula Pariyaya, the discourse on the root, because it's extreme. It's extremely important. It lays out the real key to understanding the Buddha's system, mm -hmm. but from a different perspective, a different way from the Brahmajala Sutta. So the Brahma Jala Sutta it focuses almost entirely on distorted views, speculative philosophical views, where the Mula Pariyaya Sutta focuses more <clears throat> precisely on ways of thinking, conceiving, right. and interpreting right. one's the, the perceptual experience. Hmm. What do you think about, so one principle in that, the word manyati plays yeah. a big role in that, so conceiving. Yeah. And manyati in that sutta is always kind of a way of conceiving which is bound up with self. Yeah. And one related principle not in that sutta is the phrase yeni yeni hi manyati tatotan hoti anyatati, yeah. whatever way one conceives it, 
where the truth is ever other than that. Um, has that epistemolog epistemological humility played a role in the way that you've like understood the, the Dhamma or would encourage it for others? Or? Epistemological humility. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, but the, you see, the word manyati sort of has a loaded meaning. Mm -hmm. It's not just ordinarily ordinary conceptualization, mm -hmm. which is not problematic in itself. Mm -hmm. The problem is in conceiving that these are conceptions which are driven by and which embody the way the commentary explains it, conceptions governed by, driven by craving, conceit, and wrong views. Uh -huh. And so those are the con conceivings or ideas that revolve around the notions through craving the notion of mine mm. or the drive to make things mine by appropriating things and grasping and drawing to oneself. And then the conceiving driven by conceit revolves around the idea of I. I am better. Mm. I am equal I am inferior, or simply I am, mm -hmm. the yasmi mana, the conceit I am. And then the conceiving governed by the tended tendency to views manifests, it could manifest at a coarse level in all of the views of the Brahmajala Sutta, mm -hmm. and at a subtler level in Sakaya Ditti, mm -hmm. the sort of subtle underlying view of a self mm -hmm. The, in, the instinctive or inherent view of self. Mm. That seems like a really good encouragement to be careful of one's own conceivings, yeah. to be sensitive yeah. to whether one's coming from this place of views or yeah. wrong view, yeah. craving, conceit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't entail that whatever one conceives or whatever one thinks, the truth is other than that. Other, if that were the time. case, one yeah. could never arrive at a correct understanding right. of the nature of math would reality. be really hard. Yeah. Excuse me. Math would be very hard. Math would be hard, <laughs> but in the Buddhist context, you conceive impermanence. But then, if the truth is other than that, then things are permanent. Mm. If you conceive dukkha, mm. things are really blissful. If you conceive non-self, then there's a real <laughs> self. Very good point. Very good. So. Moving on, this is the next set of or sutta yeah. and commentary that you translated, uh, Diga Nikaya number yeah. Yeah. 14 or something? Yeah, it's 15. Yeah. 15, Mahanidana Sutta. Yeah. And two themes that I wanted to draw out of this are, the first is regarding, um, and here this is based a large, long elaboration of dependent origination. Yeah. And curious, many Westerners learn about dependent origination, which talks about the cause of yeah. suffering coming from yeah. birth, and yeah. we're apt to understand that yeah. in psychological terms, which are true. Yeah. But how would you advise someone? How do you see this three life versus one life interpretation yeah. of dependent origination, and how do you encourage or suggest that other people um, mm. appreciate it within your understanding of yeah. the Buddha, the Theravada Buddha Dhamma, which is mm. vast? Yeah. Did you say that birth and well, old age and death have psychological? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's you can say every moment. You know, I'm being reborn, and then there's the death of the ego. Yeah, and and I like don't that. think that is the actual meaning of birth, old age, and death uh -huh. in the formula for dependent origination. Of course, okay. there are suttas which define what is meant by birth, yeah. and it's pretty clear that it's biological. Well, actually, beginning with biological conception in the womb mm -hmm. and then culminating in the biological birth, the parturition, separation mm -hmm. from the womb. And old age is described very clearly as getting gray hair, um, the wrinkling of the skin, the teeth Deep. start to break, if one becomes weak, the faculties mm -hmm. lose their effective e efficacy. And then death is described very clearly as you know the laying down of the body, the breakup of the aggregates. Hmm. Yeah. So 
the aim of the Buddha's teaching, you have to say dependent origination against the aim of the Buddha's teaching, which is breaking the cycle of repeated birth and death. Mm. And so what I find, the people, a lot of people or, or Westerners are attracted to dependent origination, maybe because it seems a bit enigmatic mm. and tantalizing and intellectually stimulating, but they might have doubts and skepticism about the reality of rebirth, or they have outright reject the idea of rebirth, so they want to have deep 12 link dependent origination without rebirth, which is a little bit like trying to have your cake and eat it <laughs> at the same time. Because here it's clear birth, old age, and death are physical, biological birth, old age, and death, and the aim of the teaching the ultimate aim is liberation from the cycle of repeated birth, old age, and death. And the Buddha has to show to show how that can be done, how one could reach liberation from birth, old age, and death. The Buddha has to show the causal dynamics that underlie the process of repeated existence. Mm -hmm. And the only formula that lays out in some detail, systematically and clearly, that particular those particular dynamics is the formula of dependent origination in a three life. In the three life, three life I think yeah. you know there's some, some contend that there's no suttas in which the Buddha says these factors belong to the past, these to the present, mm -hmm. these to the future. I think there are several reasons for this, though that would almost require a little lecture mm -hmm. to go through it. But one reason is that. The threefold divi temporal division of dependent origination applies in all time periods. Mm -hmm. So if you say that these factors are the present, those are the past, then it seems that ignorance and volitional activities occurred in mm -hmm. the earlier life, mm -hmm. not in this life, mm -hmm. and that birth, old age, and death are going to occur in a future life, not in mm -hmm. this life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but to see, the way I see it, that the Buddha makes this three life distinction in dependent origination. I call it an expository device for showing the dynamics that underlie the cycle of repeated birth and death. So you get to understand the way these 12 factors really work. This is where the Patisambhita Magga mm. becomes useful, which says that when you have ignorance and volitional activities, there's also craving, clinging, and karmic existence. Mm -hmm. And then when you have feeling, where does it go? Upadana. Consciousness, name and form, feeling, a, a contact, fe consciousness, name and form, the six sense bases, contact of feeling, those five factors, those five are subject to birth, old age, and death. And so in this way, you have five factors in the past mm. producing five factors in the present, and then the same five factors from the past are in the present producing the same mm. five factors in the future. I'll see if I can put on a, there's a very good chart of that that I yeah. know of in yeah. both Buddha Dhamma. Something else I wanted to draw up from this uh, translation of the commentary and the sub-commentary to the Mahanidana Sutta is that part of the sub-commentary is a work which you've translated there and separately as its own book called The Treatise on the Parami by the sub-commentator named Dhammapala. Yeah. And it is such a good work. And yeah. I think one interesting theme to draw out from that yeah. is a lot of Theravadins, especially convert Theravadins, are just so gung-ho and they feel that you know we're the real we're the real buddhism there's yeah. this theravada conceit yeah. and we think that you know there's this hermetic seal around theravada that okay we're theravada and there's no you know, yeah. interaction between mahayana yeah. Yeah. but this sutta you know, goes into the parami the yeah. Yeah. spiritual perfections and could you talk to this theme of the relationship between a goal of arhatship versus yeah. a goal of yeah. being a buddha yeah, what's I've always found rather puzzling and problematic is that 
in the suttas, one doesn't find the Buddha explicitly expounding a bodhisattva path to Buddhahood, and one doesn't find anybody coming to the Buddha and saying, Bhante, you know, I have the deepest veneration for the arhats, but you are like the teacher of the world, the supreme, fully enlightened one in the world, and your task sort of is to liberate countless humans and devas. So I aspire to become a Buddha. Mm -hmm. How do I go about doing it? Mm -hmm. And you would think that things like that would have taken place in the Buddha's time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the certain period, probably this was part of the pre-Mahayana landscape, the period that bridges what we call archaic Buddhism and the emergence of Mahayana Buddhism. Various, in the different Buddha schools, the thinkers, the doctrinal specialists were pondering the, that issue, maybe largely based on the Jataka stories of what is the course that the Buddha followed to mm. become a fully enlightened Buddha. And so a bodhisattva ideal eventually emerged probably in all of the schools, even in the Theravada, maybe in some texts that are incorporated into the Pali Canon, into the Sutta Bhitaka, the Buddha Vangsa and the Charya Bhitaka. But then at a later time, this would be the period of the later commentaries and sub-commentaries, maybe 6th century, 7th century, the commentator Dhammapala composed this treatise on the Paramis. The idea of Paramis actually emerged in the Theravada school earlier, in, we find it already in the Buddha in the Buddha Vangsa, mm -hmm. I think, in the Charya Bhitaka, but I'm not sure. But definitely in the Buddha Vangsa, mm -hmm. which maybe is first century B.C., mm -hmm. second century, first century B.C. But Dhammapada elaborated on the concept of the Paramis and provided detailed explanations of how one aspires to follow each paramita or parami, and how one puts it into practice. And what I found of interest with, with doing this, I was puzzled by the very definitive tone that Dhammapala was using when he was describing some of these practices and the requirements for getting the the prophecy or the prediction of future success from the Buddha, the aspirations and so on. I was wondering, where is that coming from? And then I found in the library, I think this was in Colombo, in the Bajirarama Monastery, first a book called The Bodhisattva Concept in Sanskrit Literature by an Indian scholar. And then I found some of similar passages that were similar to those in the treatise on the paramitas in that book by the Indian scholar, and he would reference the Yogacara Bhumi, mm -hmm. which is one of the major works of the, Mahay <laughs> the, the Mahayana <laughs> Vishnya, uh, Yogacara school. Mm -hmm. And then I found also in the Vajra libra library a Sanskrit copy of the Yogacara Bhumi, in Roman script, and I was able to read, at least to some extent, Sanskrit. And so I looked through the Yogacara Bhumi, and I found those passages in there. And so it became clear to me what happened. And the wording was just so similar. It couldn't be that they were just drawing the two sources, drawing from a common source, but that Dharmapala was drawing, from, was familiar with the Yogacara Bhumi, and was drawing these passages from it and incorporating them into his treatise on the mm -hmm. paramis. Mm -hmm. And this leads to a situation where some years ago, this was a Taiwanese nun mm -hmm. told me that some, you see, the, the, like the senior Theravadan monks who read the commentaries become familiar with that treatise on the mm -hmm. paramis and take it, this is the pure 
unadulterated Theravadan doctrine. <laughs> so they come to Taiwan sometimes and conduct retreats. And then at the end of the retreat, they give a discourse on now you're returning to the worldly life. So what do you do? You have to cultivate the paramis. And then they'll give some talks on the paramis. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the nun told me, here we have the very traditional Theravadan, Burmese Theravadan monks coming to Taiwan and teaching us Mahayana Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I can, I'm very sick. It's actually, it's in the commentary to the, um, to the Brahmajala Sutta. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's, oh, okay. it's not, the, not the Mahanidana Sutta. Oh, okay, okay. So all of the books we've discussed so far are available for free distribution, both from BPS, the Buddhist Publication Society, of which you were the editor for 20-plus yeah. years. Um, and so, yeah, people can find all these on the Internet. Definitely recommend that treatise on the parami. One thing I found really inspiring was that finding, going back to the Pali, yeah. these are words, like all of the Pali words are pretty much, you know, words which are in the oldest strata of the canon. Yeah. So I'm just finding these fascinating and wonderful mm -hmm. similes and causational loops for how to cultivate generosity to the ump degree. And yeah. it's just very inspiring. It yeah. doesn't, it just mm -hmm. makes generosity, precepts, renunciation, wisdom, energy, you know, mm -hmm. et cetera. It just gives encouragement to do that. And mm -hmm. I didn't feel that it was necessarily had to be Mahayana. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you said that these books are available from the BPS in Sri yeah. Lanka. But several of them have been published in the United, in North America mm. by Pariyati, and so they can be ordered from within North America. That's fascinating, and people should do that. These are, yeah, I think Pariyati, are they based in Washington yep. State? Or, or Alaska? Yeah, it's in yeah. Washington State. Yeah. yeah. This uh, next book, also by BPS, is yeah. another one of these sutta and commentary, The Fruits of Recluseship, Diganakai yeah. number two. Yeah. and its commentaries. And the theme that I wanted to draw out of this one is the value of a monastic. Yeah. So yeah. that's the whole contents of this. And actually, this book, I found it in the small library of a Goenka center. Mm -hmm. So like I went to Goenka, I didn't even know he was teaching Theravada because he's so ecumenical in the way he yeah. teaches things, which was great. I didn't want a religion at the time. Mm -hmm. But then once I'm super into the meditation, I find this little library, which is almost hidden, at the Shelburne Falls, I think, or maybe the Canadian Center. And I find this book, and I'm like, wow, mm. this, is, this is it. And monks, like, this is, this is the path. <laughs> and so it really uh, was very influential for me. Mm -hmm. But it is something which I think modern secular Buddhists, they could see that they might think that the role, the archetype of a monk is baggage you know, from an Asian context mm. that can just mm. be dispensed with, you know. Mm. We have modern problems now, and it's almost negligent for someone yeah. to leave the world, yeah. you know. So what is, what do you feel, could you draw out this theme of the value of renunciate? Well, I think we have to recognize that, okay, first let me take the position of this book within mm -hmm. I call it the Bhikkhu Bodhi Quartet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Brahmajala, Mula Pariyaya, and the Mahanidana, those three deal very much with doctrinal issues, okay. with sort of, say, theoretical issues, issues of understanding, proper discernment, discrimination of what is the Orthodox. true Dhamma, mm -hmm. what are the principles of the Dhamma. And then the fourth volume in that series deals with the practice, with the implementation of the path. How does one reach the goal that is pointed to in the other three volumes, that liberation of the mind through mm -hmm. non-clinging? Okay, and then the particular function of the monastic. We have mm -hmm. to remember, you know, that the Buddha Dhamma was transmitted for 2,500 years. I deeply appreciate the lay practitioners, mm -hmm. earnest, dedicated, devoted, sincere, knowledgeable lay practitioners. But the Buddha Dhamma was not transmitted for 2,500 years by a community of lay practitioners, by a lay, quote, Sangha. Mm -hmm. 
the Buddha gave the charge for preserving and transmitting the Dhamma. He didn't call Anattapindika, Visaka, and um, Chita the householder. He <laughs> said, <laughs> come to the monastery of entrusting the Dhamma to you. It's your job to preserve and transmit the Dhamma. No, he said, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, that's your job. <laughs> and that's how it's worked through 2,500 years, whether in South Asia, East Asia, excepting Japan, or Northern Himalayan region. It's been the monastics that have preserved the Dhamma because they are the ones first who can specialize in really studying the Dhamma in detail and in depth and who have, at least in theory, the appropriate conditions for practicing it and embodying that quality. Don't forget that the goal of the Buddha, is a, of the Buddha Dhamma is an ultimate re, re, renunciation, an ultimate relinquishment, and adopting the monastic form is, you could say, a provisional or preparatory or expedient renunciation aimed at the ultimate renunciation. And so the Dhamma is always pointing in the direction of relinquishing and renunciation. And the monastic form, in principle at least, is based on renunciation and encourages renunciation. So more of a, a follow-up question is a theme of the accessibility of jhana. So like one thing that it said that a monk is able to do is get this kaya viveka, this bodily seclusion, yeah. so as to be able to get the mental seclusion yeah. necessary for uh, yeah, the jhanas, these yeah. mental absorptions. And I'm curious if, if you wanted to just say anything about that, like how, because there are modern teachers who yeah. teach jhana retreats, and, yeah. and you can pay you know, $1,500 and then go on a week-long retreat, and mm. you know they have statistics about how many people attain jhana within that week. And um, yeah, I don't know, just to draw a, maybe a little bit on this this point of what in your understanding of the Theravada Pali explanation of jhana, how accessible is it for someone who's living a normal normal American life with a job and et cetera? Yeah, well, of course, as we see in the text, a sort of prerequisite for attaining the jhanas is... We have vivijeva kamehi, so detached or secluded from sensual pleasures. And then vivicha akusalehi dhammehi, secluded from unwholesome mental states. And those unwholesome mental states are taken to be the five hindrances. And so we can say that the first vivijeva kamehi is pointing in the direction of bodily seclusion, though it is not constantly exposed to sensually enticing objects, mm. and vivicha akusalehi dhammehi is pointing to seclusion from the inner unwholesome mm. states, the mm. five hindrances. Mm. And so the monastic form provides good conditions for that kind of seclusion. Mm. Um, but what seems to me to be the case you know, I don't, can't make judgments about particular people, but it seems that people's ability to succeed in meditation, whether in the, in the practice of samatha or the practice of vipassana, is very much determined by past background, by accumulations of merit and past paramis. Mm. And so I've heard of cases of lay people even just going on short retreats and getting quick success in their samatha and being able to attain jhanas. And I don't think that they're necessarily sort of overrating themselves and boasting about attainments that they haven't attained. Where I know many monks, and I have to include myself in that category, <laughs> who strive pretty diligently, but can't claim to reach high levels of attainment mm. either in samatha mm. or vipassana. Mm. So this depends very much on karma conditions. Mm. Um, as I said, past paramis. Mm. But I would say for one aiming for the jhanas, even lay people to be able, if with 
those paramis, for those paramis to be activated and to propel them into those higher states, they adopt a, a situation, a condition, which is modeled on that of monastic life. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're at home with the wife and children, coming home after an eight-hour job, it would be extremely difficult, even if they have a mountain of paramis mm -hmm. to attain the jhanas or the insight knowledges, paths and fruits. Mm -hmm. But if they have those accumulations and then they go on a month-long retreat, then those paramis can be catalyzed and manifest and manifest it and spill out in the form of their attainments. And add face, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube to their wife and children and it's all the more, all the more difficult. Yeah, but then the, the thing that always worries me is when <laughs> on Facebook I went on a retreat with so-and-so, got the third jhana, still doing some work to get to the fourth. Yeah. And then I've heard cases of even lay people living at home, work, working, claiming to attain our hardship, and then after attaining our hardship, getting married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, such a circumscribed and I think wise, wise answer yeah. to that. Um, so Bhante and I ended up talking for about an hour and 40 minutes. So we're actually going to split this into two parts, and this is the first part in our series on Theravada themes in translation with Rikabodhi.